when people say no one needs a gun for this or no one needs a gun for that, to be quite candid with you, no one needs a gun for anything. I'd be the first person to admit, if this is a problem, if my guns are, are stolen and, and the storage laws aren't right, such that if crime is being perpetrated because of my lawful use of guns, then I would say, look, we got to get rid of the guns. But my, my opinion is, it's quite simply, that's not the case. The Rational View is a weekly series hosted by me, Dr. Alan Scott, providing a rational, evidence-based perspective addressing important societal issues. Hello and welcome to The Rational View. I'll be your host, Dr. Al Scott. On this episode, I'm going to continue with a series of podcasts on gun control. I started a bit of a, an experiment last week uh, where I laid out my hypotheses of what I'll learn, and now I'm going to proceed with interviewing some experts and people who have information on gun control and try to seek out the facts and establish a rational viewpoint on this and, and just walk you guys through exactly how one might go about doing that. And so the first thing I want to do is listen to opposing viewpoints and get the, the experts' opinions, and then I can maybe uh, synthesize something at the end of this, which will help us all move forward with a more rational position on this. In May of 2020, when the Liberals came out with a recent assault rifle ban, the CBC ran a series of articles on gun control. One of these was titled... Those who want total ban on handguns lack understanding of firearm sports. The author of this article is Jamie Melnick. Jamie is a criminal defense and human rights lawyer practicing in London, Ontario. Jamie, welcome to The Rational View. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining me here. Uh, I'm really interested in hearing your viewpoints on gun control and, and some of the stuff you said in your article. Could you summarize for our listeners the thesis of your article? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean... I'm not going to ever probably be one of those, uh, you know, gun toting guys that says no matter what, we should always be able to keep our guns. If someone were to be able to show me statistics that shows definitively, like, look, owning these kinds of guns and private ownership under the current regime of regulations and law creates a, a hazard or a safety concern for society. I would be one of the first people as a gun owner and lawyer to say we need to make some serious changes. My, my main problem with the order in council uh, uh, from May of 2020 was that there's no evidence to support that there is actually a problem with legal gun owners feeding any, any kind of crime guns to the criminal community. And so what I, what I am asking, and I have written to my MP in London, Ontario here, Kate Young, uh, to do is let's start collecting the real evidence and real statistics on where do these guns come from when we find a gun at the scene of a crime or when we are able to, to get a gun after a crime, a crime has been committed, can we trace it? Can we find out where it comes from? We, we can certainly trace where guns have been manufactured. I mean, first of all, the manufacturer stamps right on the gun and almost every gun has a serial number on it. If the gun doesn't have a serial number on it, then we know it's strictly speaking a, a crime gun. The, the, the problem is Canada does not have a, an actual consistent way to track firearms and, and firearms used in crime. And the order in council was made before any kind of evidence that, I, that I'm suggesting should be gathered, you know, ha, ha, is, is put in place. So I guess my ultimate thesis is that when people say no one needs a gun for this or no one needs a gun for that, to be quite candid with you, no one needs a gun for anything. Uh, we live in in a, a pretty, you know, a pretty lucky part of the world, and I can go to the grocery store and buy whatever I need. Although I am, I'm, I'm a hunter as well. I'm a sports shooter. Mm -hmm. I shoot trap. I shoot IPSC. I shoot IDPA, uh, which are both pistol disciplines. I shoot them all over the province, and in some cases, in different provinces in the country. I'd be the first person to admit if this is a problem. If my guns are are stolen, and and the storage laws aren't right. Um, such that if crime is being perpetrated because of my lawful use of guns, then I would say, look, we got to get rid of the guns. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But that, my, my opinion is it's quite simply that's not the case. The order in council also, in my opinion, targeted a bizarre set of firearms. Mm -hmm. So w when we talk about the, the AR-15 platform, uh, that's, that seems to be the gun that everybody gets up in arms about. Uh, excuse the pun. <laughs> they, they, the the AR-15 was developed 
sometime in the 1950s, I don't have the date in front of me, obviously, uh, I, I believe it was 52, uh, and it was by a company called Armalite. And it was, uh, the AR actually stands for Armalite Rifle. Mm -hmm. So it was the Armalite Rifle 15. It, they did not do well with it. It did not take off. They sold it to Colt. They sold the, the rights and the patent to Colt. Uh, and I believe it was in the early 60s. I believe it was 1963. I may be wrong about that. Uh, and Colt sort of tweaked it a little bit, but ultimately manufactured as the M16. Okay. And it became a, a fully functioning, fully automatic rifle for the American military. Hmm. In Canada, we're not allowed to have fully automatic weapons. So the AR, the, the quote AR-15 platform that we have in Canada as a restricted weapon, and it, it's really not at all the same as the M16 or the AR-15 platform that is allowed in the United States. In some parts of the United States, you can have a, a fully automatic weapon, which means you pull the trigger once and that gun will just keep firing. Mm -hmm. There's what's called a sear mechanism in a gun. The firearm will keep, it'll just keep firing. In Canada, we, we're not allowed those. Okay. So all we can have in Canada with a, uh, a rifle like a semi-automatic 223, it's called, which is a caliber, and I can explain that if you'd like, uh, it's, it's a five-shot magazine. So you have to pull the, the trigger five times to shoot five shots, and then you're out. Okay. Uh, and that's that's the law. So Canada already has, obviously, stricter gun laws than the U.S. Canada has extremely strict gun laws compared to the U.S. to the point where some of my friends actually say to me, they're like, Jamie, like gun, owning a gun, like a firearms ownership in Canada is already illegal. And to be candid, and some of them might be upset when I say this, I don't, I don't adopt that point of view. I, it's not illegal. It's a privilege for sure. And you have to take a lot of, uh, and by a lot, I mean, you, you need to take about 36 hours of training. You have to do the test. You have to pass it. Uh, the RCMP does background checks. And then once you have a firearms license, the RCMP, every single day, your name is run through a check. So if I were to be arrested today for anything, the RCMP will find out about that. And someone will come to my house and say, look, last night you got arrested for impaired or a domestic or mm -hmm. what have you. And they, they will take, if the police at the first instance didn't, then they will come and collect my 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 pal. Oh, wow. And say, wow. your possession acquisition license is, is we're suspending it and you, you can't have it right now. It's a big, a big uh, contrast to the U.S. I think huge contrast to the U.S. I mean, the, the United States. But I mean, first of all, in Canada, we don't have any kind of anything similar to a right to bear arms. Strictly speaking, we don't even have a right to property. Um, the closest thing we have, uh, I would say, is under Section Seven of our Constitution. We have the right to life, liberty, and security of the person. No court in Canada has ever said that the security of the person or security of liberty has anything to do with owning property. So it's perfectly legit, so to speak, for the Liberal government or a Conservative government to say, we're, gonna, we're taking away your guns because they're unsafe. And people ha have been vitriolic, particularly the gun community has been vitriolic about the way the Trudeau government did it by, by using an order in council during a pandemic. My personal take on that is I think it was a cheeky way to do what he did, mm -hmm. what he wanted to do. But if we back up and there, there's a number, as you're probably aware, there's a number of court challenges with respect to uh, the order in council and excellent top notch lawyers are involved with it. And I've spoken to some of them and, and they've, their arguments are well in hand. M my thought on that is that if the, if any government wants to change the firearms legislation, they can. I don't like that it was done by an order in council, but I think that if uh, Justin Trudeau had done that firearms amendment through Commons, it probably still would have happened. It would have still gone through the lower house. It would have been approved in the upper house. It would have taken longer, mm -hmm. but then we would we wouldn't really have anything to hang our hat on. I mean, ultimately, what's happening is people are saying we're going to fight this ban. Uh, on some sort of legal technicality. Some of them are fighting it on Section 7 of the Constitution. Some are fighting it under a particular provision of the Criminal Code, which provides that you can't uh, put an order in council to ban firearms if those firearms are used for sporting purposes. Hmm. 
and the AR-15 platform is used for sporting purposes. So there's a couple of legal arguments that are interesting. I think at the end of the day, if they win, which they may well, particularly uh, there's a lawyer named Solomon Friedman who I have, he, he's brilliant. He wrote the annotated uh, copy of the Firearms Act. He's leading the charge on this with the, uh, the CSSA and uh, as the Canadian Shooting Sports Association and the CFFR. But at the end of the day, if they win, the Trudeau government could come back and say, "Okay, fine, we're gonna we're gonna run this through the normal procedure." Yeah, this is always this has always been a highly polarized political issue, um, falling pretty well strictly on party lines. It seems you know it's a rural urban divide, as far as I can tell. You know, people in cities, their experience of guns is gangs and killings and threats. And people in rural settings, it's, you know, wildlife, it's hunting, it's sporting. And it's, you know, a, a clear dichotomy. The liberals are playing to their base by doing this and, and drumming up support amongst their base. This is uh, quite an interesting debate about the legal technicalities of it and the challenges and the legal. T and you're right, it's probably something that it's legal to do based on the Constitution and all. I'd like to get a little bit just uh, your your position on this. You know, you're a, a sports shooter. Have you always been a handgun enthusiast? How did you get to be interested in guns? Are you a rural background? And yeah, no, I appreciate that. So ultimately, the, the your pivot is exactly where I want to go. The legal issue to me is not ultimately that interesting. The interesting part to me, or the the more policy direct part, is I, I don't believe. I mean, I'm also a practicing lawyer. I have a construction company also, so I'm a, a working guy. I'm a carpentry, carpenter by trade. I, I think that, that laws should be as minimally restrictive as they need to be. And I have been shooting since I was about five years old. I grew up in London, Ontario. When I was 13, my father moved us outside of the city, north of the city, about 35 minutes or so. And uh, it was awesome. I mean, I, I grew up in a time where my dad would say, yeah, let's go. We're going to, you know, totally different time. You, he'd leave some 22 shells on the table in the morning. I was 14 years old. He'd leave some 22 shells on the kitchen table in the morning and leave a note before I even got up and said, have a good day, be safe. You know, like that wouldn't, that just doesn't happen now. Mm -hmm. So admittedly, I grew up in, in a very liberal household with respect to firearms, but I, I had been taught since I was five to, you know, to, to treat the gun with respect, to be careful, to never fire a gun if you don't know where, you know, the bullet could end up. And it wasn't, I didn't get my first handgun, Al, until uh, I think probably, f it was probably four years ago. So a neighbor of mine, I live in West London. It's a, it's a pretty suburban area. I think, you know, so, <laughs> There's a, there's enough of us that have guns that uh, that the others would say really, <laughs> <laughs> they'd be pretty surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, he he got me involved and said, look, uh, I'm I'm doing some coaching for what's called IDPA, which is International D Defensive Pistol Association, uh, where you run through a course of fire with just it's basically cardboard targets. You have one person beside you who's watching you the entire time and another person behind you who is timing you. So there's two people watching us as we go through these courses of fire. And I went the one night and I was hooked and I had never really cared about handguns up until that point. And it was just a great way to spend a night with 20 guys that get together every Wednesday at our club, which is at East Elgin in Elmer, mm -hmm. a wonderfully run club. And, uh, it just became an awesome bonding experience. And we did that every year or every week rather for about three years. And then the pandemic hit and you know, we've, we've done some outside things, but that's how I got involved with handguns. But as far as shooting sports goes, I, I, you know, I've been doing target shooting, clay shooting, hunting, like I said, since I was about five years old. So I, I agree with your, your stance on laws should be minimal, right? I, I'm all for freedom and, and against the nanny state of, you know, you know, you need to have some personal responsibility. I like that that sort of statement. But again, there's this balancing act that we have to do. And you, you said it yourself. If there's evidence that it affects society negatively, then we should consider um, appropriate steps. Now, you, you state that there's no comprehensive statistics to, to suggest that handguns are a problem. You claim that gun advocates rely on tragedies and terrible crimes to support the need for these controls. 
uh, and you call for a comprehensive review and meaningful analysis of the types and sources of firearms used in committing crimes in Canada. You obviously have an idea where this analysis will lead. What do you think we would discover if we were to go there? So my, my suspicion, so first, just to back up, I, I do, I don't want to say there's not a, pri a problem with handguns. I do, I, it, particularly in Toronto, uh, in parts of Toronto and in parts of uh, BC, Vancouver in particular, there, handguns seem to be used a shocking amount of times in cr the commission of crimes. That's a problem. My suspicion though, Al, is that if, if proper tracking was done, the vast majority of these firearms my, this is purely a suspicion, but I've got nothing else to go on because the RCMP and Stats Canada doesn't provide me with anything better, is that these guns would be largely brought over from the United States. And I, I suspect that they're largely uh, illegal guns. The reason that I think that is if you have, so there's two classes of firearms in Canada. There's restricted and unrestricted. The the real deadly guns uh you know, are the rifles, and in fairness to the, the Liberal government, the rifles that they targeted on their uh, ban are, are they're, they can be dangerous guns. I mean, they're mostly what's called 223 caliber firearms. The 223 just means 0 0.223 of an inch. Uh, they were designed, though, not to kill people. They were designed by the military or, or implemented by the military to wound people. Uh, these firearms, though, are restricted in Canada. The, the AR platform is restricted. And the difference between restricted and non-restricted is you have to register a restricted firearm. So an AR gun or an AR platform gun, what people call, often call black arms, is, is a firearm that if I were to go to my local gun store and buy it, I have to show my RPAL and I have to give my, my information. They write it down. It has to go through the RCMP. The RCMP has to say, yes, that's okay. And it's in, in Ontario anyways, it can be anywhere from four to eight weeks before that gun gets transferred to my possession. It's not fast. It's extremely slow. I would say Quebec's the fastest. I've purchased guns out of Quebec and it's been inside of a week that the transfer takes place. So if I've got this gun in my possession and I just went through all the work with the RCMP to register my restricted firearm, how likely is it, and this is a rhetorical question, but how likely is it that I'm going to sell this gun to some guy? So let's say I've got an $800 gun and, and some guy says, I'm going to give you $2,000 for that gun. So I sell him the gun for $2,000. It's still in my name. Mm -hmm. So there's, we're, we're as, as legal gun owners, even if we were thinking about some sort of scheme where we could divest ourselves of these guns and make money on it, we're disincentivized by, by the, the current structure that the RCMP and the government has put in place. There's a huge pool of illegal guns in the south, just to the south of us, that people can access. Exactly. And so, you know, it doesn't take very much, you know, Google searching to find all the different ways that they've set up mailbox depots, at, you know, drop off depots where they, they rifle, <laughs> rifle, another pun, they essentially get guns up to the north of our border. They drop them off on the south of Canada's border. We've got obviously the, you know, the hugest unmonitored border in the world, and those guns get into Canada. So I would say that it, it, I'd be shocked, to be honest with you, Al. I would be shocked to find. I, I would say any guns. I would be surprised if any gun that was found at a crime scene was sold by a legal gun owner. And it could be traced back to that gun owner as having been what what they call like a ghost gun or an illegal gun. I I I don't think it would happen, and that's a huge that's a massively bold statement. I I see that, but I just don't think that anybody would who who goes through the trouble to get the license to own a gun would take the risk to sell a gun illegally and keep it in their name. It just doesn't make sense to me. No, I agree. I, I think maybe the the other argument would be that you know guns can be stolen and it's just availability of these weapons these illegal weapons is a problem and by banning them it decreases the likelihood that there will be guns in the system that people can get access to you know obviously the the data problem is is a is a real one i'm not sure why it's hard to find good studies and good data on this or people just don't want to take take these statistics but there are some things out there if you look on stats can and and other sources there are a few uh, 
a few statistics about guns available. Um, U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention examined causes of death in 26 developed countries among children up to 14 years of age using national health statistics provided by the countries. And they showed in the research that the death rate for children who were victims of unintentional firearm injuries was nine times higher in the United States than in all of the other countries combined. So obviously correlation doesn't equal causation, but access to firearms seems to be the main difference here. Is that? I agree with you. And and the United States, I mean, I, I'm a subscriber to all, all kinds of trade magazines in the United States. And, uh, I don't mind saying to my, you know, American shooting friends that a lot of their laws, in my opinion, are are far too lenient. You can you can get guns down there. It's a joke. I, I'm not I'm not I, I would never want to be taken as a firearms advocate that says, oh, we should have it like that. I, I don't think that's right. You can get a gun down there in some states without having ever taken a course on it. Mm. And in the states that do have courses on it as a requirement to get a firearms license, the other states actually make fun of them. You know, if you read the magazine Guns and Ammo, which is an American publication, it's it's a, it's about as American as it can get with respect to uh, you know the right to bear arms amendment, and it, it's it's shock it's actually shocking. Like when I read it, I, I sort of cringe because I, I I would never want to see a Canada where we can just you know buy a gun because we want one and never take you know any kind of education on them. It's it can be a potentially Regardless of my criminal intent, it, it, the the danger in a gun is it's ridiculous. I mean, I I've got two daughters, a twelve year old daughter and a ten year old daughter. My ten year old hunts with me quite frequently. It, it, it you know like if you don't have the proper training, I can just when you read about the things about accidents, and it's just like this. It's because of improper training. And in Canada, we have an excellent mechanism, but that's a different thing altogether, too. We have an excellent mechanism for training for hunting, but that's another course altogether. So just because you get your RPAL, or your Restricted Possession Acquisition License, or your PAL, which is your Possession Acquisition License for Restricted, you're, you're still not allowed to go and hunt. You're not allowed to take that gun out into the woods. You have to take another course to do that. And that's another whole, uh, you know, three-day course or two and a half day course technically a friday saturday and sunday about the safe transfer of firearms from one person to another climbing a fence walking through the woods getting into a boat and you have to pass pass a written and a practical test for that the united states has virtually nothing akin to what we have in canada for that it's 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 shocking to me <laughs> so i would never want to be a guy i do have friends that say oh we should be more of the united states and we should be able to have you know wear belt or guns on a holster and you know walk to walmart and carry a gun uh, I, I personally don't see the appeal in you know putting on my watch and putting on my gun but each to their own uh, I, I do see the appeal in everybody being properly trained and properly understanding the rules and the safety requirements around these firearms and setting up a camaraderie around them. Mm -hmm. You suggest in your article that, um, uh, for example, safety modifications wouldn't be accepted, like you make the analogy to limiting the speed of racing cars or making golf clubs out of plastic. But of course, significant developments have gone towards driver safety and collisions in racing. You suggest that handguns could be made safer or non-lethal, but that would impact the enjoyment of sport shooting. Do you have any other thoughts on that particular line of reasoning? No, that's an interesting point. So <clears throat> there's a, a type of a projectile, which is a, essentially a bullet, that's called frangible. Uh, which means if it hits something, it can even be a soft target, uh, like wood or even probably cardboard or a, a telephone book, and it just breaks up on contact. Uh, I personally, I'm not against that. If if the government of the day wants to say, let's uh, make sports shooting can only happen if you're using frangible fire uh, ballistics or projectiles. I mean, ultimately, it doesn't really change the sport. Uh, but I, uh, to be candid, I think it would be window dressing. When I'm shooting IDPA or I'm shooting an IPSC event with the guys anywhere in Ontario or Canada, if you hit something that you're not supposed to hit, it's a big deal. And I've never seen someone get hit with it. So I shoot what's called a nine millimeter handgun. If I shoot someone with a nine millimeter handgun with a, a lead bullet, which is called a 147 grain bullet, 
That's the weight of it. It's a relatively heavy bullet. It, it could kill a person. If I shoot someone with a nine millimeter frangible bullet, I, I should be just as embarrassed and admonished as if I, it's, the whole point is how safe are we being? If we're being safe with lead bullets, then we don't need frangible bullets because the safety is not a concern. These, the sport could for sure be modified, but it, it to me makes no sense to ask people to spend more money on frangible bullets for to mitigate a safety concern that's not actually a concern, unless there's evidence to show that, hey, uh, you know, over the last 10 years at IPSC events or IDPA events, there's been, you know, eight people have been killed or shot or hurt as a result of these events. But that's just simply not the case. The camaraderie and this, the safety precautions that we take when we're running these events, I think most people will be shocked by. They, they, I think the, the images of a bunch of like weekend warriors running around with guns and shooting willy nilly. And that's just, it's, it's nothing could be further from the truth. Like if you take your gun out of your holster when you're not supposed to, you're done. Like you're going home. There's a write up. Mm -hmm. you, you have to talk to the, uh, your, the person who trained you to get your, you know, so th that's another whole thing. To, to shoot in any of these events, to shoot IDPA or shoot IPSC is a whole other course. So that's something that people need to understand. Not, nobody can just show up and say, okay, well, I've got my, I've got my pistol license now and I have a gun. I want to shoot tonight. You're not allowed to do that. It, it, in all of Canada, you can't do it. But particularly in Ontario, we, we're one of the only provinces that has an actual regimented set of uh, criteria that you, you have to pass in bef before you can get what's called your black badge. And that's to shoot these events. So it's, it's, it's just a very step-by-step -step process. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I, I find that very few liberal politicians are willing to come out. Uh, actually, not just liberal. Very few politicians, period, are willing to come out and actually understand what happens when we're, when we're doing these events. Yeah, it's become the problem with any of these hyper-polarized issues that people are are either one side or the other and they're not interested in discussing the the middle ground and it's all making emotion laden memes to try to poke fun at the other side as far as i can tell now i think the idea that people want to do here with, with these bands is basically just decrease the the frequency and the availability of these things and you know as you say, the people that are doing these in events are not the problems. It's the it's the illegal market. It's the um, the black market of guns. It's gangs. It's it's that sort of whole underground that's the real problem. And and how do we address that problem? Is the question I think that people are trying to get at. And maybe they're going at it the wrong way by just doing a a whole scale ban. One hundred percent, they're going at it the wrong way. So look. If I'm being perfectly honest, if you could uh, create a law and every gun manufacturer can't make guns anymore, obviously we'll have less gun crimes, right? If, if, if you just say no more guns can be made, the guns that are in existence will eventually fade. And in probably, I'm guessing, 200 years it would take. I mean, I, I own a couple of antique guns that are over 100 years old. So, you know, they're, they're <laughs> by today's standards, they're crummy guns that like you wouldn't want to use them in a crime, but you could. Uh, so in 200 years, you'd probably get rid of the problem by discontinuing the manufacture of firearms. My concern is we're, we're going at this the wrong way. We're saying, hey, we've got a problem with crime and guns are being used in crimes. I agree. That's that is a problem. What we need to do is say, where are these guns coming from? And. If, if it turns out, and we don't know, and I've already sort of put on the record that I, I, I'd be shocked if the, any of these guns, let alone the majority of these guns, are coming from legal gun owners. I, I don't believe any of these guns are being sold by legal firearms owners. I don't, I don't believe that. I'd, I'd put anyone to the test to show me a legal firearms owner that had a registered, restricted gun that sold it. If it gets to the point where we've got a bunch of firearms that have been stolen from legal firearms owners... Then I think the first step isn't to say, let's restrict, you know, let's ban those guns. I think we need to say, let's change the laws on how we store the firearms. I do believe that our storage laws are, are probably too relaxed in Canada. I would, I would endorse and get behind a law where it says, look, you have to spend 
a couple thousand dollars and buy a vault. It's called a gun vault or a gun safe, not a, not a locker, an actual safe. Mm. That would be fine by me. If it showed that the lack of safe storage of firearms was leading to crimes, I would say, let's step it up. Let's, let's make it a rule that you have to have a real safe for these guns. And if it's cost you 2,500 bucks to get it in your basement, it's an 800 dollars, it's an 800 pound safe. Oh, well, if you don't want it, don't have guns. That seems very logical. I've, I've also read, uh, I've heard people saying that it would be possible to have uh, biometric trigger locks or RFID uh, trigger locks installed on all handguns. Uh, so that only the owner can fire them. Does that seem like a reasonable option? I'm not sure. There seems to be a lot of opposition to that, obviously, but it seems like a good solution. No, it's, it's an interesting question. I mean, the whole idea about RFID to me would go to first, you'd have to show the condition precedent to that would be lots of firearms are being stolen from people that are lawful firearms owners, period. If they're not, then then why do I have to put my digital signature on a firearm when no one's stealing it anyways? It makes no sense. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I, I, I go back to where where are they getting the guns and where are they, you know, and, and why are we not collecting better information on where the guns have come from and how they've gotten to these crime scenes? Someone has to prove that there's a problem before we can address it. Well, many people would say that, you know, Canada has something like 100 handgun deaths every year. Um, but lawn darts were banned after 55 serious injuries. Uh, no deaths in Canada. What? Why the dichotomy for, for handguns? It's obviously more of a problem. That, I think it's a great point. And uh, I would actually be more on side with handguns being more scrutinized than the AR-15 or any uh, restricted rifle platform, to be honest with you. Uh, I think the very fact, though, that handguns have not been uh, sort of targeted by any government shows that the government's not ready to deal with it because they don't have the statistics to, to back it up. Look, looking at all these issues, it seems to me that it's, it's the balancing the benefit of society to the risk to society and all of these things, you know, there's no black and white in these things. And the problem is when they become hyperpolarized, it all becomes black and white, but it's really a gray zone. It's a balance of the benefit to society versus the risk to society in all of these cases, I think. Absolutely. I, I, to be honest with you, I don't think we've ever really entered the gray zone in Canada on guns. I, I, like, I, I kind of hope the conversation that you and I are having could, could be a catalyst for that. Mm-hmm. Because what I'm saying is, look, I see on one side, I see the black. I see like, awful, a coal polytechnique. People, you know, the Ruger Mini 14 was a gun that Mark Lupine used w- with devastating effect. You know, and then on the other side, I see the guys that I shoot with and the guys that I hang around with and hunt with. And they're like, I've never, I've never had a problem. I get that. Those are the blacks and the whites. Mm-hmm. The gray zone is, but we, we have to acknowledge that a firearm is an inherently dangerous uh, piece of machinery. And we have to have a, an honest discussion about how dangerous is it? And what, once we know how dangerous it is, which is properly supported by statistics, how, how do we mitigate that? And if we can't mitigate it, I would submit we can mitigate it with, you know, better storage laws and things like that. But if we cannot, if we couldn't mitigate it, if we say, okay, people are stealing it. Okay. My, my response would be if people are stealing guns, make better storage laws. Cause if someone comes into my house, they're not stealing my guns and, unless they're here for like two hours. If they want to grind away at the safe and then they, they could get my guns. But, uh, if, if that's not good enough, then then let's can we make it better? And if we can't make it better, then I would be one of the first firearms owners to say, then I think we need to give them up. Mm-hmm. If, if, it's, if it's a true catastrophic problem that we can't mitigate, but I, I honestly don't believe that the safety of the citizenry is in any way in jeopardy because of legal firearms owners. We're, we're definitely the, the tail that's getting wagged by the big dog to the south uh, in this case. And, and yeah, there's there's very little that our legislation is going to do to that problem, uh, other than show some sort of moral leadership, perhaps, and, and show 
you know, the difference in gun crime here to the to the gun crime there. Um, but that they don't seem to be noticing. <laughs> no, I mean, they they have systemic issues, though, that, that thankfully, I mean, we, we have some systemic issues as well. But they have some systemic issues that thankfully we'll, we'll probably never have to face. <laughs> I'm a criminal defense lawyer, so I, I see the catalysts for crime. I can't imagine being a criminal defense lawyer in, say, Michigan. Uh, it's it's a totally different world. If if I was an American lawyer, I you and I would be having a very different conversation. I'd be saying like our gun laws are brutal. You can you can get a gun like a, there's the the Simpsons episode where Homer Simpson goes in and wants to get a gun, and the the uh, gun shop owner says well, you get, there's a seven day waiting period. And Homer Simpson says seven days, but I'm angry now. <laughs> like, <laughs> we, like that's, yeah. that's you know like Matt Groening is genius he's genius to point out the problems there but that would never happen here I mean we we take weeks months sometimes to get guns transferred into our possession can we get a gun today yes I can I could go tomorrow to my local gun shop and and buy a non restricted shotgun or rifle and bring it home instantly off the shelf so I don't want to trick or, or appear to be tricking anybody to say that. Everything is like a two or three month waiting period. That's not the case. The fact of the matter is most of the people, the vast majority of people in, in Canadian history who own firearms aren't buying guns to do mass devastation. It just isn't the case. And we, we look at, uh, you know, I, I hate to use current examples because I don't, I never want to disrespect the people that are facing the tragedy, but the Nova Scotian, the Nova Scotia shooter, he spent all that time, you know, mocking up a car to make it like an RCMP car. Every single firearm he had was an, an illegal firearm. And the RCMP were informed of his illegal firearms. I mean, this is a matter of public record now, so I'm, this is not speculation. They, 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 it was reported. People called in concern saying, I think he has illegal firearms. He's told us where they are. Nobody did anything about it. So why don't we just maybe take a step back start doing things about the reports that we actually get, mm -hmm. start keeping track of, you know, uh, criminal weapons when they're used, and then t take some time and say, no, no, we've got a robust set of data. We know now what we should be doing. Mm -hmm. That's my concern. So we're getting towards the end of our time slot here. Just um, maybe ask you to, if you have any final message for people who, who just say the risk is too great? We should just ban all handguns. We should, we should just do a across the board ban. Do you have any sort of final message to these people? I think ultimately what I would say to to those people is find somebody, and come out and actually operate a firearm in an environment uh, with people who are lawful owner firearms. And if you can't find those people, call me and I will take you out to my club. If you're in this part of southwestern Ontario. And we will meet. Nobody has ever gone out with us and said that was awful. People, I have had people that come out and say, like, you know what? Thanks for taking me. This isn't for me. That's that's fair. Mm -hmm. But you, you got to try it, and you'll see. Like under properly supervised circumstances, it's it's an outstanding sport. It really is an outstanding sport. Can a gun be used for illegal purposes? Obviously, I mean, we all know the answer to that. Of course it can. So can cars, so can all sorts of things. But, you know, banning them wholesale, I, I just don't get it. In particular, I don't get the, the kinds of guns that were banned by the ordering council. I really don't get that. Yeah, that I mean, most, odd. most guys don't even have ARs. <laughs> it doesn't seem to come from a, a rational position. To be honest, I think it was virtue signaling and pandering. Uh, I, I don't think that it came from a place of a very clear uh, political discretion. Typically, I like people being treated properly, and I, I don't believe that legal firearms owners have been treated properly in, in this instance. So that's something that I'm going to have to consider very carefully when I go and, you know, cast my next ballot. Okay. Well, thank you for your time, Jamie. I appreciate you joining us here in The Rational View. Thank you. If you're enjoying what you're hearing, please consider visiting my patron page and becoming a patron of this podcast at patron.podbean.com/slash/the-rational-view.